Well, thanks everybody for joining and let's get started. Welcome to our webinar, how to deploy modern Android devices securely in your enterprise. Two housekeeping points before we get started. The session is being recorded and you will receive a link over the next few days by email. Secondly, please submit your questions throughout the presentation in the Q&A session section and we will be addressing these towards the end of the webinar. This is today's agenda. Enterprises are embracing the accuracy, speed and flexibility of the Android operating system. Today we will explore why Android Enterprise has become the system of choice for mobile devices. Gain insight in how Android devices help protect your infrastructure from the ever-growing sophistication of external threats and uncover ways to implement Android devices without overloading your existing resources now or in the future. Regarding deploying modern Android devices securely in the enterprise, we couldn't ask for a better team of speakers to explore this topic with you. Mike Burr is the lead Android enterprise security specialist and has been at Google for over seven years. He currently works with the Android ecosystem partners to include OEMs, carriers, EMM partners, and system integrators to promote modern Android enterprise security by educating, enabling, and providing subject matter expertise. Mike also collaborates with enterprise customer stakeholders in IT, security, networking, infrastructure, and C-level executives to educate on how to secure business data on Android devices. Kicking off the presentation will be Doug Moll, Director of Solutions Architecture for Barcodes Group US. Doug has been in the industry deploying mobile equipment and services for 17 years. He leads a team of talented technical experts responsible for pre-sales consulting on the entire portfolio of Barcodes Group Solutions with a strong focus on mobility and deployment planning. Thanks for joining us today, Doug and Mike. Doug, please take it away. Thank you very much, Edwin. Well, before we dive into the conversation on Android and the benefits of the platform, we wanted to spend a few minutes discussing how we got here. So let's go back in time a bit. The last major mobile platform shift was almost 20 years ago. Before moving to Windows, everything was DOS. All available de devices were text-based only. Go ahead to the next slide. So maybe some of you remember the uh, Telzon PTC 960 or the Intermec 2425 pictured here. These are examples of popular devices in the late 90s and early 2000s. At the time, terminal emulation dominated in the enterprise world and wireless standards were still in flux. At home, we were likely still using dial-up, if anything at all, for wireless. Next, let's look at some popular technology around that time. Sorry, previous slide still. The Nintendo 64 had just been released. Uh, Mario Kart was certainly a big deal for me around then. Also, the first ever Palm Pilot had just hit the market. It had 128 kilobytes of RAM, but could be later upgraded to one meg if you were willing to replace some of the internal hardware. Note that if you had recently, have a recently released phone right now, you probably have the memory of about 64,000 of these early day Palm Pilots. All right, so in the early 2000s, the first devices running Pocket PC 2003 and Windows Mobile 5 appeared on the market. These devices are probably going to look a little bit more familiar to everyone. The MC9090 and the CK30 were especially popular, and I know some of you may still be using these models. This was a big change. All applications needed to be rewritten. So there was an initial panic, but uh, reactions were very positive as users began to take advantage of the improved hardware and software. There's a pretty good chance that if you had a phone around then, it was one of these. Of course, mobile apps didn't exist like we know them now, but we did have the snake game. Next slide. So after 15 years or so, device hardware has incrementally changed, but the Windows Mobile and CE platforms have remained largely constant. From 2010 to 2018, enterprises had bought more than 15 mil million mobile units, 99% with the Windows Embedded OS. CE7 and Windows Embedded 6.5 platforms, the last generations of the Windows Embedded infrastructure, were 
released in 2010 and 2011, respectively, and mainstream support ended in 2013 and 2015. So like the migration from DOS to Windows in the early 2000s, we reached a point where migration was necessary. Next slide. So enterprises were starting to look at options by the mid 2010s as mainstream Windows support was coming to an end. At this point, mobility had really taken off. In 2013, for the first time ever, mobile web traffic eclipsed desktop web traffic worldwide. The mobile market as a whole had exploded. By now, Microsoft had effectively left the marketplace entirely. Windows Phone made up just 0.15% of the install base on mobile devices worldwide in 2017 as consumer devices took off. Windows Mobile was basically non-existent with below 0.00 worldwide usage. Microsoft did have both Windows Phone and Windows 10 IoT platforms, but neither of them had a migration path from the old Windows embedded operating system. So like all other options, they would require developers to completely rewrite applications. On the consumer side, Microsoft's Windows Phone platform never really took off. It peaked with only 3% of the global market share. In fact, in January of 2019, Microsoft officially recommended that users of Windows 10 mobile switch to Android or iOS. Meanwhile, as everyone knows, iOS and Android have dominated the consumer space. So rugged mobile device manufacturers had a choice. iOS being a closed platform was not a good option for a purpose-built rugged data collection device. So the market could either continue with Windows embedded in CE or invest in Android devices. Next slide. So in 2015, there was time. Many considered Android immature from an enterprise perspective. But in 2021, Android has truly reached maturity and, and the time is up for Windows CE and embedded. Next slide. So what issues are there running on the older platform? There are certainly changing expectations of the incoming workforce. Touch support is limited on these older devices and newer workers are not familiar with devices that feel like they're 15 years old. Keep in mind, some of these workers don't even know what a Palm Pilot is and have probably never even played a Nintendo 64. The older platforms are outdated. The solutions available are really hamstrung by the platform limitations. New applications are not available on these older devices and the older workflows are simply not as efficient. There are also technology limitations. Syncing with PCs has become increasingly difficult without Microsoft support past Windows Vista. And older devices don't have modern hardware advances in things like improved battery performance and flexible scan ranges. The cost of supporting and maintaining legacy solutions and applications is certainly increasing. And older devices do not have the needed security updates to protect your business. So what does the new platform bring? Next slide. This is where it gets exciting. The move from 90s era text-based data collection to touch-based solutions is ultimately possible with Android. Research shows that we now have 39% faster typing speeds. Uh, speed improvements are also driven by faster apps, better Wi-Fi connectivity, and simplified workflows. We have longer uptime for things like hot swappable batteries. Another measured result is 15 to 20% increase in overall productivity. We have improved scan engines for difficult barcoding conditions, fewer keystrokes and familiar interfaces with menus and touch screens, and improved validation workflows. The data shows that this leads to 60% less errors overall. Security and stability. Uh, Mike will speak to this, but with Android, we have a modern updated OS with regular security updates. There's an external ecosystem of software and support options. Also, we have uh, part and repair availability like we haven't in the past with current devices with guaranteed support for many years to come. Lastly, there's simplified device management with options like EMM and uh, platforms like SOTI. Again, Mike will go into more detail here, but having an enterprise platform to manage your fleet of devices is truly game changing. Uh, workforce agility. This is a big one. Uh, getting workers up to speed as quickly as possible is, is very important. Uh, worker onboarding is a big issue in today's labor market. Uh, in the warehouse, the current average onboarding time for a new worker is close to four weeks, and this can be drastically reduced with modern hardware and software. Ultimately, the sooner you migrate, the sooner you can start taking advantage of, of some of these benefits. Next slide. 
All right, so when it comes to planning your migration, uh, the barcodes group is, is definitely here to help. The first consideration is timing. We can help you figure out when the ideal time to move forward will be. You will need to upgrade eventually, but we can help you choose the best strategy. When we think about planning a migration, we will look at app compatibility first. We're going to help you assess your existing and future app usage and help with app migration if necessary or new software selection if, it, if it's needed. Next, we'll assess the variables that are unique to your environment and make sure we've accounted for all of your current and future needs. And then based on all of these variables, we'll help you select the right devices. Lastly, we're here to help with the implementation, staging, cutover plans, and including ongoing support. And we can help you plan a pilot before you do any large rollout. Next slide. All right, so in summary, Android is here to stay and we're here to help you make this easy. With this new platform, we're enabled to provide a really streamlined implementation and support your solution throughout the device life cycle, from device selection through the procurement and deployment. And then after the devices are deployed, we're set up to support them with tools like EMM enabled with our ongoing true support services. So to get you started, we're, we're definitely having a lot of conversations to evaluate current state and make recommendations on future state. Again, the time might not be now, but the sooner we start planning, the better. So please do reach out to your barcodes group contact or reach me directly at the information here and we can start help you, helping you move forward. All right, with that, I'll turn it over to Mike who can speak more about how organizations can securely leverage and deploy Android. Hey, Doug, thanks a lot. And uh, appreciate the opportunity here to speak today um, and give you some insight into um, what Doug referred to as, as uh, moving from a, uh, what we call here at Google, a legacy mobile platform. Uh, and in this particular space here where you have rugged devices, you know, we work with many of uh, the device manufacturers, but I think, you know, when you look at it from a perspective of, of managing these, uh, these Android devices, um, and Doug alluded to the fact that uh, the time is imminent, it's going to happen, is that these device manufacturers have actually moved to Android. Um, and, uh, and it is sort of important to start planning that migration phase. Um, you know, I've, I'm very fortunate enough to, to have um, been working with lots of large customers over the past several years. And it, it, can, be a, um, it can be an exercise in, in uh, planning and deployment and migration, and it, it doesn't happen overnight. So uh, I do urge you to start planning that appropriately and, and use barcodes to help facilitate that. But um, it's, it's never more important now than ever to get everything right, specifically with mobility. You know, you've got your, um, there's more endpoints now that are mobile. Um, you know, you've got your handhelds, you've got uh, the rings, the things you hold in your hand, and you just sort of make those extensions of how folks operate and it becomes an extension of them. So there's tons of endpoints out there that are actually based off of Android. Um, these things are mission critical. Users are remote, they're in warehouses, they're on trucks, they're in their homes, they're everywhere. And so there's also more regulations and there's, 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 there's a lot of opportunity for um, things to go wrong, specifically around security, data leakage, loss of devices, so on and so forth. So we wanna make sure we get security right. We wanna make sure we got deployment right. So I'm gonna kind of take you through a, an introduction of what we call modern, uh, we call modern Android enterprise management. Um, next slide, please. So, uh, Doug, you saw this sort of alluded to in Doug's uh, presentation, but um, this information is actually provided by IDC and it's corroborated by Forrester and, and many other external third party uh, entities. But um, Android is actually the most used device on the planet today when you combine rugged, knowledge worker, uh, even consumers. When you look at it from a global perspective, we nearly have 80% uh, of the devices on the planet. So again, that goes to show you that the breadth of our, our, our system um, is, is very robust and it allows uh, for many customers, device manufacturers, partners to kind of uh, make the right solutions for you at the right price point. Uh, next slide. So again, we, our strategy is pretty simple. It's, it's to empower every worker so they can get the job done. It's to enable you as a customer 
to manage every Android device exactly the same way, no matter who the OEM is and no matter who the EMM is. I know, um, you know, Sodi is, is a wonderful partner of ours at Google. Uh, I believe they're a partner of, of Barcodes as well. And they've done a great job with uh, managing this life cycle here of managing modern Android. But the, the third part of when you're managing those devices is to do it in a very secure way. Um, and Android out of the box today, since like Android 7 and 8, um, we've actually amplified the enterprise level of security uh, on those devices. So don't think about consumer, think about the tools that are built in and the features that are built in, which we'll cover later, that are there for you to manage on these fleet of devices, the built in. And then it also helps you stay compliant, like uh, for pay mobile payments, right? There's there's PCI compliance on Android. For overseas, you know, Android is actually uh, in the uh, in the in the area where we can support GDPR. Um, we meet lots of regulations for healthcare, like HIPAA, uh, and we have lots of cloud certifications, ISO 27001. So we have to keep these devices in compliance, so that you as businesses can actually uh, do the same. Um, and then we want to be able to support whatever the use case is, whether it's a, a ring based on Android, a, a handheld, a, something that hooks onto your arm, glasses, whatever it is. There's a lot of things based on Android. And again, we can manage them. And, we're, and when we come full circle, that's how we actually empower every worker to get their job done. All right, next slide. So what you get with Android, this is generally speaking, there's a lot to unpack here and we won't, we won't like dig into each one too deeply, but the, the beauty of Android is that um, there's, there's thousands of devices. Now, if, if you're not familiar with the Android world, you, the first thing that will come to mind is, oh my gosh, thousands, how do I manage all of them? That's, fragment, that's fragmented, they're all different. That is a mantra, that is a stigma of the past. Modern Android, since Android 5, actually has a very common uh, management plane, which we'll talk about, called Android Enterprise. Again, it doesn't matter what OEM it is or what EMM manages the device, we have moved away from legacy device administrator mode. So these APIs that are built into the operating system directly from Google are supported on any device that is GMS validated or has Google mobile services. Um, there's, there's applications in the public play store that can be deployed in a business environment and configured remotely. Um, you can deploy private apps very securely through what we call a managed Google Play. There's a private Google Play store for you and your enterprise. Um, if you have a, a case where uh, you have a device that needs to have two, what we call two personas or a personal side of the device and a work side of the device to give a, a, a you know, um, certain use cases uh, to, to like knowledge workers where, you, you know, you're allowing them to do personal things on, on the device and also want to very strongly secure the business data on the device. We, we have very strong separation um, and provide that capability. And then again, like I mentioned earlier, security is the biggest thing here. Um, we, we know that we can manage the devices um, remotely, configure them, deploy them. We can uh, deploy applications. We can manage those applications, but we need to do it in a secure fashion. And one of the things we also did was drive built-in security through three layers, hardware, software, uh, or operating system, and then services. And we'll unpack that here in a few minutes, but we also wanna make sure that we have um, seamless management. And that's what I just mentioned is reducing that management fragmentation where, again, I, I can't say this enough is, it doesn't matter what device it is, if it's GMS certified, the same Android APIs are on all of them because it comes directly from Google, the operating system that is. And then each OEM, such as Zebra or some of the other manufacturers, they built in extra APIs that you can configure through Android Enterprise Management through something called OEM Config that basically is targeted specifically for that manufacturer. So it's a, it's a very streamlined and easy way to manage these devices. Next slide. So again, we've kind of hit this. Um, and, and again, we wanted to make sure that it's for every worker, for every use case. I know most of the most of the folks on the phone here today are probably in, in the, in the um, specific device or kiosk or uh, what we call full device manage mode. But we have redefined the standards for security, the management and the comprehensive way that we promote uh, this in the operating system so that, again, every user, every partner, every admin and every OEM and, uh, and, and the rest of the partners have a very consistent way to manage and deploy apps and configure security on these devices. 
Um, and again, it's flexible and you can get the right device at the right price to do the right job. It's not like you have to take a square peg uh, and shove it into a round hole and you're scraping the corners off and you're wasting your money. You get the right device for the right software for the right price to do the right job. And that's what Android delivers. All right, next slide. Um, again, we kind of hit this, but you know, the knowledge worker areas where you think of your normal user who has a, a personal or work side of the phone, but in, in, um, in many areas, uh, even in banking, uh, a lot of the kiosk machines, some of the machines you would never think are running Android actually run the Android operating system and they don't even have a screen. So we have a lot of, uh, of deployment of Android for business use. Um, the main ones that, that I work with outside of government and finance would be areas in field services, uh, retail, manufacturing, professional service industry, hospitality, and healthcare. Now there's many, many more, but again, the proof point here is that there's devices in the ecosystem um, that meet the specific need of that industry or that vertical, and then dropping the right software on those devices. And remember, the devices can all be managed with the same EMM in the same way, which is uh, makes it very useful and practical. All right, next, next, uh, next slide, please. So we give you centralized administration. So Android Enterprise gives you the ability to deploy devices uh, across your fleet, whether it's uh, you know with a with a token, or with a QR code scan, or something we call zero touch enrollment, which I'll hit here in a minute. We give you the ability to set policies. You push those at time of enrollment or any time during the, uh, the life cycle of that device. And that includes device policies, users, uh, and even applications in a very robust manner. And then for the managed apps components, this is a really big part. I alluded to this earlier, something called managed Google Play. So what we've done is we've, we've we built this up um, in such a way that you get a private managed Play Store and we call it managed Google Play. You can deploy public apps, you can deploy your own home-built private apps. The key is they flow through Google services, so they are, um, they are ensured to be more secure. What we've often found is that applications that are built uh, privately, developers make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. Um, and they'll deploy an app, and unbeknowing to them, they may be using a vulnerable SDK, or they may be implementing SSL or using certificates or certificate pinning incorrectly, which makes the app vulnerable to man in the middle attacks. So when you deploy an app through Manage Google Play, we help the developers by scanning those apps and making sure they just as secure as any other app uh, on Google Play. And we scan them very deeply and work with that developer to make those apps very strong, uh, very safe. All right, next, uh, next slide, please. So I mentioned uh, the, the, the deployment uh, uh, the deployment models, and Android Enterprise gives you a flexible mobility uh, policy to deploy apps and devices in many different ways. There's, there's something called a, a dual persona environment or a single persona environment. Uh, and you can see here, we, 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 you've heard the terminology BYOD. Well, that's basically personally owned device where the user owns a device, they bring it in, they have a personal device, they may have Gmail account. Then we can allow them to what we call inflate a work profile. And you'll see here on the image to the bottom left, you'll have uh, and a good example is Gmail. Any app that has a blue briefcase on it means that app is for work. Now they're on the same screen, but they are completely separate all the way down to the kernel. And those two Gmail apps do not even know about each other. So they're very separate. They have two identities, one for work, one for personal. And that's how we sort of separate that. Um, then there's personally enabled, which looks the same to the user, but this gives IT control over the entire device and gives you more controls on the personal side without, um, without reducing the privacy for the user. So uh, you can give, uh, give them still the ability to do things that they would like to do on the personal side, but have more control over um, some of the device settings. And then there's the work only modes and the dedicated modes where there's no opportunity for a personal account on the device and they're locked down either for a specific set of apps and a single identity or even uh, pinning a specific app to the screen in something we call kiosk mode. So there's again, different models to deploy uh, these devices. Uh, next slide, please. So I mentioned earlier, one of, the, one of the great things we added a few years back was something called Android Zero Touch Enrollment. Uh, this covers uh, almost all Android devices today 
uh, out of the box. And it's a super powerful tool um, because it gives admins a very simple and easy way to, uh, to deploy and enroll devices. And it gives the users the ability to self-enroll devices that's seamless and secure. And the way it works is you simply add the device information to the Google uh, Zero Touch console that integrates with whatever EMM you choose. And when that device is taken out of the box and turned on for the very first time, or even after a uh, factory reset, it will begin what's called a zero touch enrollment. It will reach out to Google and say, am I supposed to be zero touch enrolled? And Google will reply, yes, here's the EMM you're supposed to use. Here's a mini configuration to get you started. And all those, those screens that you typically see in the consumer flow when you turn an Android phone on are, are no longer there. Um, it'll step the user through a, a seamless enrollment up to and including only requiring the user to add a passcode or nothing. It can be a, a completely kitted self-service uh, enrollment where the device just starts enrolling all the way through application deployment, identity injection, to where the device is ready to use within uh, just a few minutes after being turned on. So that's zero touch enrollment. All right, next, uh, next slide, please. Now, I mentioned earlier keeping the personal data safe on a private phone. Uh, if you do have that use case, there's a clear separation between that work and those personal apps and data. Only IT can uh, see the, the work apps and data while uh, the individual's personal stuff or personal uh, areas are, are private. You have a lot of controls over that work profile where you can actually disable it. So if you have hourly workers um, and you're allowing them to have a work profile and your business apps are in that work profile, uh, you can set policies that actually disable the work profile uh, uh, during certain times. And again, that's done through your EMM and with the APIs available in the Android Enterprise. Uh, next slide, please. So now we're going to kind of switch gears. So that was a very like quick and, and uh, uh, kind of overview of, of Android Enterprise. There's a lot more to it. You can go to android.com forward slash enterprise to learn more about the, the actual APIs and the services and features that are in there to help you manage and migrate uh, to Android as your platform with those devices. But we're going to switch gears now into a little bit more about security um, because we don't want to use devices if they're not secure. Um, and um, so let's go ahead and, and go to the next slide and we'll start unpacking those. So Android has always been in the model uh, since Android 5 of what we call a layer defense, defense in depth, right? I think any good security model uh, doesn't rely on one particular, uh, one particular technology or one particular stack or one particular area. The best defense is in layers and that's exactly how Android does it. Um, we do it in the four layers. The first is in the hardware. The second is in the operating system. The third is with services or Google services which I'll talk more about as we go through this. And then finally, the controls that we build in to Android Enterprise to let you take advantage of and control all these services, the OS features and the hardware components on these devices. Now, the key to remember here is these are, these are the same through any Android device that's on uh, you know, Android 5 and above. These services, uh, the operating systems change slightly, but most of the services that I'm talking about today will be will be valid and present on all Android devices that are GMS validated. All right, let's go ahead and, and jump forward. So let's start at the bottom layer with the hardware. Um, many people don't know this, but, you know, because they still think that uh, Android is sort of like this wild, wild west. But um, here at Google, we have something called the compatibility definition document. Now, when you when you hear that, you think, oh, it's compatible so that that means apps have to be able to run on all devices. And that's true. The original goal of the CDD was to ensure that any app from Google Play that was deployed to any Android device would actually run the same way. However, as we've moved forward since Android 5, like seven years ago, um, a good portion of that CDD is actually based on security. Now, the CDD is super important, and that's the policy part of uh, of Android. So we at Google deliver Android in the Android open source pl uh, product or platform. It's our uh, open source version of Android and that's where the Zebras and the Honeywells and the Samsungs, they'll take our version of Android, they, they tweak it and build it for their devices. And then they use the CDD, compatibility definition document to build Android in a compatible manner 
and to, uh, to meet the, the requirements that are specified in that CDD. And then we test it with something called the certification test suite. That is so that Google can verify that the, the devices are compatible uh, with Google services, with applications, and that the hardware and operating system software is built to our standards. So that part is no longer what we consider wild, wild west. Uh, we actually have a very tight handle over uh, specific hardware components that are built into every Android device. Two of the big ones I like to discuss is we've been requiring tamper resistant hardware uh, on all Android devices since Android 7. And we started mandating it on Android 8. Um, that's super, super important because your encryption keys and your uh, certificates that you deploy for authentication are no longer stored in a software uh, database in the operating system. It is required and coded into the operating system that these are stored in hardware-backed tamper-resistant secure elements or our hardware-backed key stores. And again, this is mandated in that CDD and you can't get GMS or you can't get Google services and you can't pass the certification uh, without these, these things being in place. Um, so that really protects your, uh, your authentication keys and your encryption keys on a device should it be stolen. Um, Verify Boot is a really key component here. And again, these keys are stored in, uh, Verify Boot is, is based on a certificate that Google uh, gives to OEMs or device manufacturers, and they store this root signing key in hardware. And every time that device boots up, we use that cert signing key to validate every single step of the boot up process. That is how we, uh, we, we can verify that the integrity of the operating system and the boot uh, bootloader is in, in fact intact and hasn't been compromised and that the device isn't rooted. Uh, so we have very strong root detection now that's based on hardware. Okay, next, uh, next slide, please. Um, so the next part is actually the, uh, the, 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 the operating system. And so we have um, done a lot in the operating system that lives on top of that hardware. And so we've taken the operating system and we have the operating system security components looking at and being built on top of those hardware components such that they are now more secure as well. Um, and we, again, mandate that. We require that in order to get GMS certification on a Google or an, I shouldn't say Google, but an Android phone. Um, it does uh, deep root detection. It, we, 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 we can detect uh, real-time kernel exploits with uh, something fancy called control flow integrity. Basically, if an application cannot deviate from its original intended execution, it's a very complicated scenario, but we have a lot of these technologies built into the operating system now that prevent memory leaks and buffer overflows. It's just very, very strong. And again, we mandate that. One of the things I often get asked is, is you know, are Android devices encrypted? And here we see since Android, uh, and since Android 6, um, devices are mandatorily encrypted out of the box. So there's, there's no question if a device is encrypted anymore. They are. Uh, I can assure you any device that has Google mobile services will be encrypted and there's no way to turn that off. Um, sandboxing is a technology, uh, you've probably all heard of it, where every service, every app is running in its own isolated uh, space and that's how Android works. Uh, each app is actually running in a little virtual, mini virtual machine for better, uh, for lack of better uh, representation. And there's a lot of controls there so that applications can't talk back and forth or you can allow them to talk back and forth when it's managed. So applications can uh, distribute information between them uh, if you so choose to do so. But it really is not at the, just at the application layer. It's also at the services layer of the operating system. So let's say there is a zero day vulnerability in something critical in, in an Android, uh, in the Android operating system. Because even the services are now, since Android 7 and 8, are isolated uh, it takes multiple exploits stacked on top of each other to break out of that sandbox. So even if there's a compromised um, you know, piece of, 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 of system service, it's not going to be able to escape its own sandbox to, to, to gain access. And then again, in that, that, that BYOD solution, um, we also have deep separation and different encryption keys are even used for the personal versus the work side of the device to protect uh, one from the other. Okay, next slide, please. So now we're going to jump into the uh, to the built-in services that Google has. Um, these are the services that are are kind of delivered to all devices that have Google Mobile Services or GMS. Um, you've probably or maybe you have heard of Google Play 
uh, Google Play Protect. That's our built-in mobile threat detection or anti-malware software that's on Google uh, devices or Android devices. We also have in device integrity services that we call that safety net attestation. Um, that's super important. Um, that is a remote attestation uh, feature that basically tells um, the EMM that the device hasn't been compromised. It's a very, very uh, strong cryptographically signed uh, attestation service. And when Google um, delivers a with that root signing key to say a Zebra device, right? Um, they'll, they'll put that certificate stored in hardware at the factory at the manufacturing time. And then we as Google, they deliver back to us and we test and verify a, a system hash of the operating system. What is the, what is the hash of that system operating system look like? And there's some identifiers there. When a safety net attestation call is made by, for example, Sodi, it'll say, hey, is this, hey, Google, is this Zebra device really this particular version with this particular um, uh, version of the operating system? And based on that particular uh, um, result, we can tell if that operating system has been compromised because the hash would be different. And then we obviously have Google Safe Browsing, which is uh, something you typically would see in Google Chrome, but it's obvious, it's actually now in WebView, which is how a lot of the Android apps display web content directly in applications. So you have uh, deep integration there uh, through protecting uh, phishing and malware coming through, say, a, a web browser or a WebView component. And the beauty here is that the EMM providers, um, they can also do what's called a, uh, they can use something called Verify Apps where they can pull Google Play Protect on the device to see if there's any, what we call potentially harmful apps installed on the device. So based on all this telemetry data, the, for example, a VMware or SOTI or Mobileye or any other EMM, their agent that's on a device can collect all this information. It's not user information, it's device status information to make decisions based on a zero trust model, whether this device can be trusted to still access company data. So when you bring all this telemetry, telemetry to, together, um, this is a very robust built-in system to detect if a device has malware, if it's been compromised in any way. Um, and uh, so we give that you know, to, the, to the EMMs basically so that they can help you protect your devices. Okay, moving forward, please. And then um, kind of teeing off what I just said is, is by enforcing that security and all those three layers below, ensuring that keys are stored in hardware uh, using the EMM, making sure that apps are deployed securely through managed Google Play, looking at uh, whether the devices are using apps properly, using those APIs to enforce compliance if a device goes out of compliance. For example, if a user tries to root their device, the EMM is going to know right away. They can wipe it. They can remove work apps. They can remove a single app. It's very robust and comprehensive. But again, everything that I've talked about is actually controllable by your EMM and you can collect that telemetry and make uh, automated decisions. I should say your system can make automated decisions uh, to either mitigate or remove uh, issues on those, uh, those, those devices. All right, moving forward. So I mentioned Google Play Protect. I'm just gonna give you a quick highlight here of, of some of the numbers to show you the breadth of Google Play Protect. Um, the number is actually much higher now or closer to 3 billion protected devices. Um, that are checking into Google every 30 days or on a 30 day window. So, uh, so your personal devices, business devices, it doesn't matter if they have Google Play Protect turned on, which you can enforce. Um, we have about 3 billion devices checking in on a daily basis in that 30 day window. Um, and those devices are being protected. The, the beauty of this is the breadth of it. Um, if let's say a rogue app gets detected in some far reaches of the, of, of the planet and a Google analyst sees that or the automated AI sees that and we flag a particular snippet of code um, somewhere like in, a, like I said, a remote part of the world, we can, within a matter of just a few minutes, um, have that, that, that code or that, that notification delivered to all 3 billion apps and quickly do a super fast scan which is what Google Play Protect does automatically for you. Um, there's over 100 billion apps scanned every day. That's pretty impressive. And um, um, on business devices, we've only seen in the last year 0.004% of 
all devices have what's called a PHA. Now, a PHA is considered a potentially harmful app. What does that mean? Well, a potentially harmful app doesn't equal malware. It doesn't equal Trojan. It doesn't equal virus. It can be an application that found a new way to exploit maybe uh, you know, an accessibility API. And so uh, where an app is not supposed to display something over a user keyboard, maybe it tried to do so, right? So there's all these things that we call PHAs. And believe it or not, that 0.004% was mostly made up of those private apps that were never deployed in Google Play that were deployed privately. And if you remember when I mentioned up front how Google Play Protect helps developers building private apps scan for those things, that's where that 0.004% came from, is that we saw vulnerable apps because developers maybe used an, an incorrect uh, version of an SDK. Um, maybe they tried to circumvent some security controls that we build in. Again, there's a, there's a plethora of these things that we see, and we've just made those private apps that much more secure. So you can actually see the data shows that um, managed Android devices that are deploying apps through managed Google Play are extremely secure. Okay, next slide, please. Now, one of the things I like to highlight real quick here um, is that uh, this, this report is from 2019, but Gartner did a, a device study, a comparison of security controls for mobile devices. We're already on Android 11, so we're two years ahead of this. Um, and and the, 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 the Gartner didn't put out a report last year. They're getting ready to put one out for this year for Android 11. Um, and uh, we'll have to wait and see what they say, but, uh, uh, but you can see we started overtaking some of the other operating systems, uh, particularly uh, iOS and some of the others. And Windows Mobile wasn't even wasn't even considered um, because it's, uh, it's it's end of life. But you can see the security controls that we have built into Android and some of the other platforms here. Android actually scored 26 out of 30 as being the strongest it can be. Uh, that's pretty impressive when that can be applied to any Android device, Android 9 and higher. Um, so that's, um, that was an independent uh, study done by Gartner, and there's many, many more uh, that you can find at android.com slash enterprise to help you with being comfortable about your Android security. All right, next, next slide, please. And we're getting close to wrapping it up here, but what's better than third party or external validation? So you're not just hearing it from me. You're not just seeing it on Google uh, 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 headlines or, or letterhead. What you're actually seeing is devices uh, that are validated and the Android operating system is validated by external third party entities. And we've done that through uh, things through the common criteria and through FIPS validation here in the US, through NIAP validation. And that is uh, done through third party labs that robustly take six months to actually deeply pen test Android to ensure it meets very strict security standards. And I'm happy to report as of Android 9, uh, Android 9, 10 and 11 uh, we're all NIAP validated for the U.S., and that is, uh, that is one of the highest certifications that are common criteria that you can get. Also, for our cloud services, um, we're ISO 37, uh, sorry, ISO 27001 validated for managed Google Play, uh, as well as the Play Store, as well as what we can deliver to you if you're, if you're uncomfortable, uh, a SOC 2 and SOC 3 report, uh, one of which would be require an NDA, but we can get those to you. Um, so that's just a couple third-party validations. Um, uh, moving on, I think we're getting ready to wrap up here. Um, but let's talk about the last thing, and that's uh, that's updates. So um, how you know in the past we've we've heard horror stories five years ago, six years ago, where Android devices wouldn't get updated for over a year. I can assure you that's not the case these days. In fact, uh, if you go to our transparency report. 75% of all Android devices that check in with Google Play are getting updates within 60 to 90 days. So that's very, very, um, that's very, very good uh, uh, roll rate. And then we also allow now updates through managed Google Play um, directly from Google of 21 specific uh, operating system components. And you have controls to delay or push updates through Android Enterprise such that you're not reliant just on the carrier any longer. Okay. Moving forward. And I'm going to turn it back over to our moderator, Edwin, and I believe we'll be ready to do our uh, Q&A. Well, thank you very much, Doug and Mike, for the insightful presentation. So now it's time for them to answer your questions. Yes, please answer, the, answer them in the Q 
Q&A area and they will address them. Now, if you would like to explore how to deploy modern Android devices securely in your enterprise, please reach out to Doug or any of the Barcodes Group entities listed on the screen. So let's start with the questions. And Doug and Mike, just take it away when you see. We just bought Zebra MC9300 barcode scanner guns that run Android OS. How do we as a company set them up to manage the devices? Tracking if lost, restrict app downloads, make sure device apps stay up to date, et cetera. I'll grab that one. So that's a great question and something I didn't quite address in the, the uh, intro presentation here. So um, ideally, um, when you're deploying new devices, we could talk to you about the staging and management of those devices prior to the deployment. But many, many times we can get engaged with you if you already have Android devices and help uh, provide some managed services around those devices, including MDM. So um, we could talk for an hour about EMM and MDM, but basically we have many, many different ways to allow you to run a, a mobile device management platform for your mobile devices. So you, if, even if you have just one or two devices, we have a way that we can uh, manage those devices with an enterprise management tool like SODI in a multi-tenant environment. So we can enable you to have you know, the full capabilities of an MDM as a service for a smaller deployment. Um, so if you have a couple of devices, we can, we can get you going in that. Or if you have many, we can set you up with your own cloud server so you can you know, manage those uh, devices and services on your own. But the, the real answer is um, an EMM slash MDM is, is probably the best way to lock down a device and manage tracking and restrict app download. Uh, but the various manufacturers do have tools outside of MDM that we could leverage as well. So best follow up as a conversation so we can consult on the best solutions there. But uh, I wanted to especially stress that if you have already deployed Android devices, we can definitely facilitate the management of those devices in a way that's going to add value to your existing deployment. And if I could just add a few things here to Doug, to, to, to Doug's exactly correct. You need your EMM to sort of manage these controls, but you know, for tracking the device, if they're GPS enabled, uh, SODI can, can monitor that. Um, and you can even set APIs that disable a user from disabling GPS so you can find them. We, we uh, through that Manage Google Play uh, with SODI, for example, um, you can apply allow lists and block lists to the device um, such that either they can only see a very restricted collated list of apps or you can give um, a block list which they can download anything but the ones you, you say you don't want them to use. So again, I think there's a lot of uh, capabilities and you would be best to work with Doug and his, his team to kind of go through all the capabilities that are there, but um, it is very robust and you would need your EMM. So you mentioned SODI. We just started using SODI to manage our Android devices. We have both tablets and handheld scanners. Is there a tutorial for updating the OS when a new one comes out? I believe you can do this through SODI, but could use a tutorial. Could you maybe high, at a high level address that, you know, Doug, first maybe? Yeah, typically we're involved in that. Um, if, if you've talked to us much, you, you know that uh, our managed services are branded as true support. Uh, and if your devices are on true support, we're going we're gonna to help you with the planning for how we're managing those OS updates and help facilitate those. Um, if, if you're not currently using us for services, um, we, can, we can certainly have a consultation about the best way that you, you can use your internal team to push those updates. Um, there are certainly some considerations when pushing updates, especially if you have a large fleet. Uh, Mike, you probably know some of the, the um, full uh, version upgrades of Android are you know, several hundred gigs, correct? So if you're deploying that in, against a large fleet, you know, there's some some logistics that need to be managed there, but we absolutely can use the EMM platform to, to push that out and we can facilitate a tutorial. Yeah, and just to add, you know, Doug, what Doug said is, is um, if it's upgrades um, through, through, through your EMM, uh, we have APIs that allow you to delay and push those updates and stagger them. So if you say have a warehouse that has low internet connectivity, um, you can stagger the delivery of those updates so that you're not saturating that particular warehouse. I mean, it's, again, it's very, there's a lot of things there, but it, you certainly uh, would advise a consultation to, to learn what's, what's available for you. 
We absolutely do have the control to manage that, though, as opposed to other platforms where, um, you know, the updates might come whether you want them or not. Um, we can, you know, facilitate rolling out those updates only when you are ready and you've had it tested and uh, the devices are in a state where, where that makes sense. Yeah, maybe a follow-up question on that. And the question is longer. Let me know if you want me to read it whole. But is there, are there any advantages versus on-prem versus SODI versus cloud? Yeah, um, there certainly are. Um, and it, it's going to matter, you know, the, the generic answer um, for any EMM is that there are multiple ways to um, deploy and manage an EMM. Uh, we're finding a lot of people uh, in the SODI uh, eco space, especially, um, preferring to move to cloud because then uh, the updates and maintenance of the EMM itself are entirely handled as opposed to an on-prem installation where you're having to manage those updates on your own. Uh, another thing that we really like about cloud is, as a part of our managed services offering, it gives us the ability to um, enable your IT team uh, with control over some of those uh, device updates from our end here uh, without the need of a uh, VPN or other uh, tool to get into your on-prem server. So we can certainly facilitate the management of a cloud server easier than an on-prem server. Uh, I see in the question, uh, this particular user is on SOTI version 13, which is, you know, a couple versions back and, you know, moving to the cloud, that um, paying attention to version becomes a lot easier and it's, it's a lot easier to not get behind the times on version. So that would probably be the main reason. Uh, there is uh, cloud hosting fees, but um, you know an EMM provider like SODI offers cloud. Barcodes Group can cloud host, or we can facilitate moving to a cloud in, in another way. Um, and then for smaller users, uh, the multi-tenant options are um, certainly beneficial as well to uh, avoid all of the issues of upgrades and migration, um, really by offering SODI or another MDM as a service uh, and taking all of that off your plate. Thanks. So does Google provide an EMM console that has no fees or do you have to buy access to this through a third party tool with licensing? Sorry, I'm mute. I'll take this one. Um, the, the Google does have an EMM console, but it, in, it's not free. Um, it, there's some caveats with it. It's cloud only and it's not necessarily, um, I want to call it generic, but it has, it, it's, um, uh, it might be geared towards certain specific industries, uh, um, uh, but the, the, but there is one there. I'd say some of the uh, uh, third-party tools that SODI might have, or some of the other external third-party EMMs, are going to add additional services that would you would probably uh, benefit from in in sort of this this mo this market. Um, uh, the EMM that for Google is typically geared more towards knowledge workers. Yeah, and adding to that, um, I, Mike, what's the total count these days of EMM providers? It's in the hundreds, right? Uh, there are there are many EMM <laughs> EMM partners, um, and part of the Android Enterprise program uh, or Android Enterprise is is we have the Android Enterprise recommended program. So while this yes, there's probably over a hundred EMM partners. Some are very regionalized, some are local, some are small, some you've never heard of. There's probably a hundred that are global. Um, but you know, we only, we've only validated and partnered ones that, uh, that can meet the requirements that, that are what we call under our AER program. And, um, but yeah, so Doug, you're right. There's, there's a lot of them out there. So evaluating them is tough. So use your, use your consulting, use it, use the, the, the resources you have to know which EMMs, um, you know, provide the services that would be best for you. And, and certainly we have a short list. Uh, here at Barcodes Group that we're familiar with and support on a regular basis uh, at various, various price points. So let's have that conversation as well to make sure that we find something that offers the features that you need at the price point that makes sense. So an actual example, would it be difficult to move from on-premise to cloud when using SODI 14.2 with multi-device models? Not that bad. Um, that's a, a fairly recent version of SOTI. We'd probably upgrade the 15 there. Um, the device models called out here include some uh, Windows embedded devices, uh, which there's some nuance to there. Um, the Windows embedded devices do not have the security features that we need for modern MDM. We can deprecate that security and make it work, 
but there's some different strategies to manage that depending on how long those devices will be in use. Okay. Question, will our older devices stop working? Uh, no, uh, they're just gonna, you know, we talk about security deprecation and, and working with certain platforms. So, you know, you know we can, we can use uh, Windows embedded devices on modern versions of Sodi with some caveats. Um, we can still use them to access web pages, but uh, with TLS 1.2, we're starting to run into limitations there. Um, so, you know, over time, there's going to be more and more modern application restrictions that are going to uh, uh, limit the usefulness of these older devices. Now, that being said, if you're running a, a Telnet application with green screen, um, there's nothing that is going to make these devices ever not work. Uh, we still have the security concerns, and then we still have the productivity benefits from moving to Android. So I still think we want to be thinking about a date to get to Android because the ROI is there, even if your devices are currently working. But by no means is, is the sky falling and there an immediate need to throw away an existing solution. And again, let's, let's have that conversation with you and uh, make sure that we have a path forward. Maybe one more. How often do I need to update my Android devices? Sure, uh, Mike, you can chime in on this as well. Um, mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, no, please. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're seeing major upgrades every year. I think uh, we can we can help uh, make a plan that makes sense for you. Obviously, with the Windows Windows embedded devices, haven't seen major updates in a, a very long time, years. Uh, we like to see, a, uh, you know, best practice would be to keep the devices entirely up to date. Uh, and we have at least quarterly uh, service packs for most major OEMs. Uh, but as a general rule of thumb, I would certainly advise most, uh, most customers of ours to uh, at least hit those major versions every year. Uh, side note on that, the devices that are coming out today have chipsets that allow them to go three, even four um, major Android versions into the future. So there will be plenty of opportunity and uh, compelling reasons to keep these devices up to date. Yeah, and then from my perspective, you know, from a security perspective, obviously you wanna keep your devices uh, updated uh, as they come out. There's business reasons why you may want to delay those. Uh, one of the biggest ones I hear is, oh, if I get an update, it'll break my apps. And generally speaking, security updates on Android do not break apps. They, they operate a lower layer. Um, you, you, sometimes the security updates that come directly from Google flow through your OEM. And so they'll add a couple of other specific updates to that security update. So just, you have to use, do some due diligence. Um, but most of the time, guys, these, these, these typically do not break applications uh, and they're well vetted and, um, you know, do them, do them as you see fit. Uh, general guidance would be, as Doug said, uh, keep your devices updated. Um, even if they don't touch the internet, because if they're stolen, there may be a, you know, um, a, a way to compromise the device that isn't that where the device hasn't been patched to protect against that. So uh, you just have to use your, do your due diligence on when to apply those. Great. Uh, one quick one came in and um, update of Google Chrome do break our MSCM apps. Is there a way around that for updates? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, that's an interesting exception because Google Chrome updates are um, harder to stop than the Android updates at the OS level. Correct, Mike? So yeah, we, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have some workarounds in the MSM environment, but um, the it, it basically means preventing those updates or rolling them back at this point uh, until the software uh, provider can, can get that. Yeah, and, and, and you're right, Doug. Typically, Chrome, I believe Chrome is on an every six weeks type cycle. That could be problematic for, you know, silly season or you know, heavy retail seasons. You don't want your particular app to upgrade, right? So um, there are some interesting things uh, being worked on through managed Google Play that would help um, delay pub what we call public app updates. Like, um, and like Doug said, there's there's some creative ways to kind of do that, but you'd certainly want to consult with Doug and his team to uh, to get insight into how to do that. Well, fantastic. With that, we've reached the top of the hour. I appreciate Doug and Mike for your uh, 
presentation and, and answering all the questions that we got in. I appreciate the audience for uh, joining today and I wish you all a good rest of the day. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone.